Hey, and welcome back to my channel. So today I'm going to talk about the parentified child of a narcissist. Parentification is when your parent decides that they don't want to be the parent anymore and they make the child the parent. So it's sort of like a role reversal. The things that you would normally expect a mother or a father to do, now they're expecting the child to do, whether it's to take care of the emotional needs of the family. Uh, if the uh, child is an adult child, that, that person may be expected to provide for finances for the mother, for the father, for anybody else like the siblings. It, the, that person may be the rescuer of the family. So basically... Uh, in the childhood, it looks like that the child is no longer a child and ha is forced to become an adult based on the things that's required of him or her. So my story with the, a narcissist in my family, I was the uh, parentified child. So what that looked like is that I was responsible for all the chores, let's say about maybe fifth grade or so. My mother uh, told me that she would no longer be doing any of the cooking. So she had turned over all the cooking to me. And also she had turned over uh, all the cleaning of the house. So how that looked is, is that I was responsible. If we were going to babysitter's house, I would have to get all the food together. If we were there for a few days, pack all the lunches and get everything together. It also looked like pre preparing breakfast, making sure that my sisters had their cereal, their milk. Uh, also preparing lunch, preparing the dinner. Then I also had to make the plates when my sisters were little. I would have to make their plates. My mother, she would uh, be in, you know, where in the house where she was. I would have to make her plate. Also, I would try to stay in our living room um, just to be close to my mother, hoping for some type of connection, which never came. But I would stay close to her. My other sisters would be upstairs. So I would be the designated one to go get her water, put extra ice in it if it wasn't enough. Every night she required popcorn, so I would have to make popcorn on the stove for her. So, it, And then I would have to serve that to her as well. Uh, she also decided that she didn't want any parts of uh, taking care of her kids. She told me that her role in the relationship was that she went to work and she provided and I needed to do everything else, basically what, what she said. So if, um, if my sisters needed perms, I had to... Unless she took us somewhere to get our hair done, which wasn't always that often, but uh, I would be responsible for putting perms in their hair, making sure their scalps were oiled. I would also have to comb their hair and put the little barrettes and uh, things like that in their hair, or if they were getting their hair pressed, uh, if we didn't go somewhere to someone else to press it, I had to press their hair. Also, um, she wanted me to wash all the clothes. She decided one time that she wanted the whole household's clothes to be washed every day so even if I came home for school I had to do my homework and also make sure I washed clothes every day and folded up the clothes I she wanted me to iron her clothes I iron my clothes I ironed the clothes of my two sisters uh all the chores of the household were on me until my sisters got older and I started begging her to allow them to do some of the chores so it was just basically like she just just totally tapped out she wasn't doing anything with them you know, even if I look back like their homework, they were, you know, they were really good at doing their own homework. I don't even remember her being there to do their homework. Even when they were smaller, I would have to bathe them, change their diapers. I would have to go make their bottles. So as soon as they were born, she had already shifted the position that she was just going to make money and everything else that I was going to do in the house. Uh, even uh, going to the grocery store, she taught me how to go to the grocery store and to bag things up. And I was thinking, okay, this is a way maybe to try to get develop some relationship with her to be seen and to finally be validated instead of her picking out false faults about me telling me that, oh, there's a mark. What's that ugly mark on your face? Oh, why your hair ugly and brown? You know, Ugh, you, I got black hair. Why don't you have black hair? You know, things like that. I didn't know that there was no hope for that relationship. So I was trying to be close. But I realized that she was teaching me how to do the groceries because eventually she would pull up to the grocery store give me $40 for the week, tell me to go in and get everything. We would make the list together, but I would have to go in and get the groceries and to bag it up. So I was bagging up food for four people while she sat in the car listening to music. Then I would come back and um, have to load all the stuff in the car while she just sat there. And then we'd pull off. So that happened every week. 
Uh, you know, so you may have noticed if, if you dealt like this in, in your home that something didn't quite feel right. It's like I'm not the parent of these kids. And I'm not saying that children, and especially I was the oldest, so I, I totally agree that there should be responsibility in the house. There should be some chores. There may be times when your oldest child may have to babysit if you don't, if the, the parent doesn't have the money. I'm not saying that those things are wrong, but to totally put all of the responsibility on onto a child, that's the part that that's abusive that I don't that I don't believe that's correct. Also, um, in my household, it went that I also became the ba the babysitter. So we would have babysitters, and I would go. We would go there over to their house. So I was still responsible for looking out, you know, for my sisters. But um, it was a relief when we had the babysitters because they would do more of the work. So I, I already came with their clothes ironed and all the food packed. The babysitter would unpack the food and just make sure that my sisters, you know, weren't getting into trouble. So that gave me some time to actually be around other kids my age and not have to be the mom on, on deck at the time. But even um, once I had friends and I would try to spend the night at their house for a while, my mother instituted this policy is that wherever I went for the weekend, my sisters had to come with me, you know. And I also thought, like, why did they, now they got to follow me everywhere I go? And I guess it was like she was thinking um, in, in my head, she was thinking, hey, you can't get away from them. I don't even want to raise them on the weekend. So you got to do that. So I was with them on the weekends and it caused for me a lot of resentment for my sisters and I started like I would bother them a lot and tease them because on the week I couldn't go outside or step on the porch and it was a dead end street I could only ride my bike up and down the street so I couldn't go out and hang out with my friends which I'm not seeing anything was wrong with that I was a girl so okay but so since I couldn't be with my friends when I was at the house, I would tease my sisters. You know, it was sort of like my mother was bullying me. So then I would sort of bully them and bother them. My sisters have even pulled knives out on me because I was responsible for making them do whatever she wanted me to do. So that created tension between them because they didn't always want to listen to me. And my mother would go off on me saying I was the oldest, make them do. So I figured, okay, I'm going to make them do it. I'm going to get a belt or, you know, I'm going to hit them or do whatever I got to do to make them do so I don't get in trouble so it was just very chaotic relationships with me and my younger sisters uh you know from the start so because I was expected to be like their mom and make them do everything that I said but yeah so they always had to follow me wherever I went then eventually that would stop some but even if I was spending night at a cousin's house they had to go I had an aunt who at the time was my best friend I went there they had to go and be there they were always you know around me it was like I couldn't escape also, another way that um, parents can parentify a child is by telling them inappropriate secrets, maybe telling them about their, the parent's sex life or telling them things that just that they don't need to know, such as family, family secrets. For instance, uh, when I was a little girl, my mother even told me about a family member who used to get beat up by someone. And my mother said, yeah. He used to beat, beat her tail, and uh, we couldn't understand why she stayed. But one day, she knocked the hell out of him, and he stopped. You know, I was a little girl, like, oh, my God. And I used to see this relative often, and I didn't know what to think about it. But one day, I confronted that relative. I'll never forget me and that relative. We were making um, a cake batter together, and she was using the, uh, what is that, the uh, hand mixer. And when she stopped, I looked at her and said, so... Uh, your husband used to beat up, beat you, and then one day you knocked the mess out of him, and he hits you no more after that. And to see that woman's face, she just looked like, who, who, who told you that? And I just said, I can't tell you, but I know. And she, we never talked about it again. She went back to making that cake, honey, like I didn't say a thing. Years later, I told my mother, I said, you know, I actually told that person that um, I knew about the abuse. And my mother's like, why? So why, why would you do that? Why would you tell? But the thing is, is that in my mother's um, head, I was the one in the wrong. But it's like, why would you tell a, why would an adult tell a five six or seven year old child about some abuse that was going on in the family long before that child was even born 
that's the inappropriate thing and it's like they don't see that they're what they're doing is inappropriate i think and you know they're just going about it as like this is just normal business you know um other secrets that were told to me my mother said that someone um that we knew had a uh, had a lot of babies and the babies had died of what they were calling crib death and my mother said that it had happened a few times that she believed that the um this person had actually smothered her her infant children at different times you know and she was like well she got like two kids now so she uh, she decided to let those live and even at the time of being a little and i mean i had to be like eight years old i say i was younger than 10 it's like something in me knew that that was wrong you know even though i had grew up with my mom and i didn't have any other examples but i knew i'm like i gotta see this person on holidays and my mother is telling me that this woman she believes actually smothered her children. Now I got to go around this person on holidays and hug them. You know, oh, happy Thanksgiving, happy Christmas. But yeah, you probably killed your smothered your kids. Let me step back away from you. You know, these were the things that my mother just totally thought that was good. You know, even um, as a young adult, I had um, got into school, um, grad, like, um, yeah, grad school. And I was taking out a lot of loans and I was getting a lot of refund money back. And I made the mistake of telling my mother, telling my sisters how much I got. That's the lesson that I had to learn. Don't tell people how much money I make. Don't tell them if I'm getting a lump sum or money. That's nobody's business but, but our own, right? So at the time, didn't know that. Told them about the money I was getting. So my mother would constantly come up. Um, she used to work in a steel mill. And when she worked in a steel mill, she was very independent, talking about welfare people all the time, talking about people who can't do for themselves calling women on welfare welfare hoes and they're taking my tax dollars doing this very prideful just very nasty about poor uh women you know and so but when she ended up losing her job she became this person who was fearful about money constantly complaining about not having money not having enough to pay this bill not having enough to pay that bill then she became like a scam artist which was new for me because she was always so independent but she started um, asking me for monies, like thousands of dollars, like saying, oh, well, this sister needs a car. Can you loan them the money for the car? And then as soon as I do it, the next sister, oh, she need money for a car. Oh, she need this. Oh, I need this. And she, my mother would always tell me in a way because she knew that I was super savior because that's how she had trained me. Uh, is to be the savior of the family. So I was like, before she could finish, I'm like, oh, I got the money. Oh, I can do it. Oh, I can loan them. Oh, this is fine. I would put myself in binds where I didn't even sometimes have the money to get myself to school because they were supposed to pay me back, but never on schedule. Something always came up. So they were giving me my money late, not considering that they were putting me in a bind, you know, but this was my fault for having poor boundaries. But this kept happening year after year until I stopped telling them how much I was getting because they even had gotten to the point that even they were trying, when I wouldn't tell them how much money I had gotten back, they were trying to figure out how much I got back, trying to count my money. One sister called and went off on me talking about how much you get. I said, well, that's private. I was trying to be extra church girl. Well, it's none of your business. I don't want to talk about them things. She's like, nobody need nothing from you. Nobody asked you for nothing. Then the next thing I, once I got my money two days later, the same um, hypocrite calls me in a very humble way oh can i borrow money and me trying to be that savior said yes where well, i should have told her to go jump in the lake and put my foot up her butt but anyway that, that that's another story but anyway so yeah so th those are the kind of things that were going on i was just totally giving all the time and where i wouldn't even consider my own needs you know so I'll, it even got to the point that um, I even had my sister had called me when I stopped volunteering to give my mother the money because I felt like this. If she needs it, she needs to ask me and humble herself instead of me jumping in. So I stopped playing the game when my mother would call with these constant sob stories. And one time when my mother noticed that I didn't jump in, she tells me, uh, Samira, this is the point where you're supposed to say that you will give me the money. And I told her, if there's something you need, I suggest you ask for it. 
and that was it. So she wouldn't humble herself to ask. So my youngest sister ended up calling me saying, why aren't you giving the money to mommy? You know how she is. You should have just offered. And, you know, and this was the whole thing that everybody was suspecting me to be the savior of the family. And I think I told my sister why I didn't do it. But I've learned a lot now. I'm not, I try not to really be into justifying myself to other people. Because to me, it's like when you're grown, you ain't got to justify yourself to nobody. And that's a process I'm working working on for myself. But at the time I was um, a bit naive. And so I justified, no, she needs to call me. She needs to ask. I'm not going to continue jumping in to save everybody. And you all are putting me in the bind where I don't have what I need because I'm giving too much to you all. Now I got to wait for you to pay me back in installments. You're supposed to pay me back two months later. Now I got to wait seven months to actually get all my money. But you're driving around in your car. You're doing this and that. But I'm the one that's put on the back burner. But that's because I allowed it. So what I noticed is today I don't have kids and I couldn't figure out why I didn't want kids and it dawned on me not too long ago when I heard somebody say sometimes if you're in a parentified uh, child you've already raised kids you know the hardships that come with it it's not all glitter it's not all gold there's a lot that comes with uh, raising kids you know and I didn't want to raise kids because I felt I've already raised them not only did I raise my two sisters Sisters. I don't know if they realize that, but my mother took care of the finances, but I raised them until I left the home. You know, uh, I've also worked in daycare and worked at churches with kids. And it got to the point, it was like, I didn't want to be around anybody else's kids. I learned that struggle. I didn't want to comb anybody else's hair. I didn't want to put any more blue magic, that thick blue and green grease in somebody's hair. I didn't want to hold a press and comb. I didn't want to iron nobody else's clothes. I didn't want to make it pack their lunches. I didn't want to walk anybody else to school because I was also responsible for walking them to school. And I, one time I almost got in trouble for that because somebody some pervert man was following my sister luckily she ran but even though with the crazy dynamics with my family sometimes my sisters would try to protect me my mother said where was Samira how did this man chase you because the school officials found out about it because they saw my sister running from this guy and my sister bless her heart said Sam was down at the end of the block you know she was watching me she tried to protect me but the truth is Sam was in the bed sleep okay I should have been walking them to school, but it just felt like for me, it was just too much. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Then I had my own um, stuff that I had to do for school. It was like, dang, I didn't feel like now I got to get up and walk them to dang school too. So they would cover for me, but I was barely ever walking them to school. They were always out there by themselves. But, um, so yeah, I just, I, I know what, what comes in with being a parent because I've done it. So it's like, yeah, I'm good. I'm like, I, in my head, I feel like I'm at a grandma stage where it's like I sometimes would like a kid around, but it's always like, yeah, I would like you around for the weekend, but then you go back to your home. Or if I work with kids um, in my work setting, I like it because I like to be around them. I like that youthful energy, you know, I, I like to play and be outgoing with them, you know, but I just don't. It's like, yeah, you're there at the school and then I can leave you. I can go home. Yay. Yay. I know some people even have said to me, I've saw, like if I would post on the internet saying, oh, I'm so happy I don't have kids, you know, people would take offense. I don't know what that's about. People that have kids, sometimes they get offended. Not everybody, but get offended. But it was like, it was, it's nothing personal. I am happy I don't have kids. I, I feel like I've already had them. I've been there. I've done that. I'm, I'm done with that. Uh, some, some other things now, what I, what I, what I notice about how to try to get over this parentify role. And this is something that I'm still working on. It's just uh, acknowledge the abuse. Acknowledge how you felt at that time. If you felt that something was wrong there, it didn't seem right. Like, why are you um, having to support your mom and listening to her inappropriate stories? And why are you having to take care of all the household needs? Acknowledge that you felt like that for a reason because it was abuse. You were misused. You were like the, the Libyan um, indentured servant or whatever. It was wrong. Also, um, how to heal from that is to acknowledging the, not only your thoughts about it, but your, your feelings. Were you angry about that? Were you sad? Were you suicidal or were you a cutter? Um, Self-abusing yourself. Acknowledge those emotions. Acknowledging the emotions does not mean uh, that... Excuse me. 
It, it does not mean that you agree with uh, what happened to you. It's just saying that I don't have to run from feeling angry or sad. When you run from it, sometimes people cover that up with drinking, with drugs, sex, and other things, shopping addictions. But no, I can feel that. It, it was sad that my mother decided that she didn't want to be the parent. It was I was angry that I was put in that role and felt abused and constantly having to serve other people where my own needs were not always met especially not the emotional she would take care of the clothes and all that the outward appearance so other people could think everything was hunky-dory and really great inside of the house even though it it, it wasn't um that wasn't the case but as far as um any needs or you know uh, any other needs those things weren't there other things we can do to get over that is to have boundaries. A boundary is saying, this is me, this is you, this is what I like, this is what I dislike. So when you have that boundary, is the, you have to practice saying no to people, knowing what do you value in life. If you value your time with your own family, you're not going to allow other people to come in and say, hey, can you do this and do this on that day? And you know your child has a basketball game. Or you're not going to give your money to someone and they, you know they constantly always asking everybody around town to borrow money. You know that you're not truly helping that person because that person is never fully satisfied. They never gotten a need. The best way to help that person would be to say, hey, have you considered getting um, financial counseling? You know, so you decide what your values are and you move toward that. Meaning that uh, if you can't take so-and-so to uh, work every day, you know, because you want to spend time with your husband or you just got home from work and you're tired, you can't drive so-and-so to the um doctor's appointments and do all that thing it's to say no and you may have grown up when saying no is not okay but the thing is the best way to practice saying no is by doing it you know over and over again and not beating up yourself because maybe you've given in so another th tip is is to uh check in with how you feel um in your uh, i say in your gut you know when someone asks you something you really don't want to do it you know because like and i can feel it in my stomach it's like my stomach is a it sinks like because like no I don't want to do it. One thing I'm learning to tell people is um they ask me something can I do it? I let them you can let them know up front say hey um I'll get back to you and give them a time frame I'll get back to you a day in a, two, a day or t in a day or two but to, just to let you know the answer may be no. That way you've already set that person up to hear the word no. Then you get back to them when you said you get back to them and you let them. No, you check in with yourself. Do I have the availability to do what's asked? Do I have the money? Do I have the resources? And if the answer is no, being up front with that person and to call them and actually say no. And, and then to deal with your, um, your um, emotions about that because you may feel that you're going to be rejected. This person is not going to like you anymore. Or even if it's a boss and you can't do a certain assignment, you may feel what's going to happen. That's a lot of that fear comes up because you probably were punished a lot in your when you were younger. But we have to be able to sit with those emotions and those thoughts and not run with it and just say to myself, wow, I need to tell my boss no, but I feel fear. And instead of saying, well, no, I don't feel it. I fear, get away from me, get away. It's saying I had a thought of feeling fear. You can have that thought, bring yourself back to the present moment with grounding exercises, such as being aware of what's around you, you know, counting the things you can see that's red in the room, or also feeling your uh, butt in the chair where you're sitting, feeling your le your legs on the chair, taking account of your breathing, breathing in and breathing out, feeling what it feels like to feel your hands where they are, to feel your arms against the chair. That's to bring you outside of your head. After you accepted the thought or the feeling, now bring yourself outside of the head. Since you've done that now, now determine what is it you value. Do you value that time uh, with your friend at work, do you value being able to complete your projects without having to do extra assignments, without extra pay, without extra time? You move towards what you value the most, even if it's taking small steps. So that's the way that you get out of that being a rescuer. I determine what it is that I like, 
who is important to me, what projects are important to me. And each day I'm making steps to get to the those that's important instead of trying to rescue everyone that comes around me. So those are things that you, you can do, not being in a, in a rush to try to please people who could really, you know, don't even care about you maybe the way you care about them. Why? Because they're owning their own reality. What I mean by that is they know what they like, they know what they hate, and they're making choices that, that best suits them, and they're not overly conveniencing themselves. I can't be mad at them. I used to resent that, but it's like I can't be mad at people for doing what's best for them. The thing is, I can take a note from their playbook and start doing what is best for me. So if you agreed, uh, if you like this video, go ahead and give me a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe uh, to, and to hit the um, notification bell. And this has been some, Tell Samira, the parentified child of a narcissist. Also, leave me some comments. I'd love to hear your feedback on this matter. Were you a parentified child? How was that for you? How? Um, what challenges are you facing now? And what steps do you take or have you taken to come out of that role? Have a good one. Thanks. Bye.